correctly and answer questions one and two. In the 19th century, scientific discoveries took a long time to produce any actual applications, and scientists might have had a case for giving little thought to the social or environmental impact of their work. That all changed in the 20th century, with the huge advances first in physics and then in biology. Science started to play a much more important role in our lives, and the relationship between scientists and society became much closer. Many scientists became increasingly concerned about the ethics of what they were doing, as they quickly saw the consequences. The benefits, such as vastly improved crop yields and the eradication of diseases like bubonic plague, but also terrible damage in the form of pollution and chemical weapons. Yes, but some scientists still claim even today that their only duty is to make public the findings of their research. They need to do that, of course, but I think the key points are that they ought to stop making any distinction between pure science and applied science, because in practical terms it no longer exists. And also, they must accept full responsibility for the consequences of their work. Now listen and answer questions three to ten. Let's explore that last point a little further. How can scientists put that responsibility into practice? By educating the public, particularly through the media and at the workplace.、Mm -hmm. Another thing they must do is advise on what might one day go wrong as a result of what they're coming up with now. That seems essential, and just as importantly, if and when things do go wrong, they need to sort them out, especially where the fault lies with the original research.、Mm. How do you feel about the international role of scientists, given that their work crosses frontiers so readily? I think it gives them, or at least should give them, a global view. In this respect, some of them are better placed than many politicians to see how new discoveries are likely to affect particular parts of the world. But will the politicians listen?、Mm, probably not. But I'm not suggesting getting involved with politics or politicians. Much better to raise the public's awareness of scientific issues so they can put the pressure on at election time. There's a problem here, though, isn't there, with the way the public sees scientists? They're all either mad or bad. <laughs> That's something they need to work on, definitely. To regain public trust, they'll have to show they're accountable, and that science is about improving people's lives. That may not be so easy. What do you think are the areas in science that really worry people these days? Science in agriculture, above all.、Mm -hmm. There's been all this media hysteria about Frankenstein foods, but there is a genuine issue here. Whether adding specific genes to plants is a valid way of increasing food production, or whether it risks the appearance of new diseases, of superweeds and pests, which links it to another controversy: using chemicals to control pests. And that's something else that was at first thought to be harmless, but we now know that the careless spraying of crops has led to all kinds of health problems for people. Plus, a devastating loss of biodiversity, with huge numbers of insects, birds, and mammals simply disappearing from the countryside, fish dying in poisoned rivers, and so on.、Mm -hmm. And of course, if we're talking about death on a massive scale, then we have to mention the role of science in enabling the military to wage chemical and biological and nuclear warfare. Which has destroyed life in so many parts of the world. Okay, I think we've identified some major topics there. There's something I'd like to add, if I may.、Mm -hmm. Sure, it's important for scientists and future scientists to talk about major issues like these, but we might also want to look at what we can do or not do in our everyday lives, particularly as many of us will be earning more money than we actually need for basic necessities. I'm thinking here of things like. Burning fossil fuels by driving everywhere. What do you think? Well, something that scientists seem to do rather too often is take planes to distant places, which is highly damaging environmentally.、Mm. For instance, to attend conferences on subjects like the disappearing ozone layer. <laughs> When nowadays they could probably stay at work and use a video conferencing link anyway, which may in fact be an example of how progress in computer science can impact positively on the environment. But going back to harmful things, what else can be done? 
again on the air transport theme. There are the huge distances a lot of consumer goods travel before they actually reach the shops in this country. This seems another extreme waste of energy, especially if much of what is being produced and carried is packaging. Perhaps it's worth shopping for more locally produced items. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to Orientation Week. Today I am here with the captain of our school's women's gymnastics team. Her name is Elizabeth Rain, and she is a fourth-year student. I hope you can all see her as an example of a responsible student and athlete, a role model for everyone. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you for stopping by our Orientation Week. Thank you for having me. Welcome to our university, everyone. If there are any of you thinking about joining our school's athletic program, I would strongly encourage you to do it. Being a part of the gymnastics team has been one of my best experiences during my time at this school. It has taught me so much about teamwork and friendship, and has even taught me how to improve my academics by prioritizing my time. I have some questions that I am sure the students will want to know the answers to as well. First of all, how did you find the time to do well in classes as well as train for gymnastics? Prioritizing is the key. You must be very organized. Every day I wake up and I know what I must do for the day. I plan things in order of importance. For example, if today I have a competition for gymnastics in the afternoon, then I know I have to finish my homework and studying in the morning. In other words, keeping an organized schedule of your priorities is very important. Can you explain to the students a little bit about your study habits? Well, I usually try to take classes that I'm interested in. This way, I have no excuse not to study because I chose the classes out of my own preference. I separate my study time by class. For example, if I have five classes for this semester, I will study for one class a day from Monday through Friday and then review for all of them on the weekend. I won't try and study for all five of my classes at one time. It is too hard to do that, to remember everything and not feel like you are going crazy. It is very important to focus the time that you set aside for studying. I do not study with the television on. I try to keep away from all distractions because I find that I learn better that way. But of course, how each individual will study depends on each person. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 16 to 20. That sounds like good advice. Let's talk a little bit about your gymnastics career. How long have you been doing this sport for, and what has been the best moment of your college participation? Well, I've been participating in gymnastics since I was a kid. My parents got me involved in the sport. Hmm, the best moment. I would have to say that there is not one single instance that stands out in my mind as the best moment, but more of a whole experience. My first year in university was definitely one of the best years of my life. I met my best friends that year and really learned to grow up and be independent. Our team went to the national championships that year, and it was an incredible experience, so I would count the whole year as my best experience in college. How about the worst moment? It is true everyone goes through bad experiences. My worst experience would have to be the fall of last year when I broke my wrist. I was unable to participate in sports for the remainder of the year and had to learn how to write with my left hand. I guess when I look back at it, though, even though I wouldn't wish this to happen to anyone, this experience definitely made me stronger as a person. It taught me to look at life with a new perspective and to really value the friends and family that are important and close to me. Thanks for your time, Elizabeth. Do you have anything else you want to tell the new students? Just have a good time. Don't stress out too much but be responsible for your actions. Work hard and play hard. That's my motto for life. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Thanks for joining us today, Mike. How did Baja California become a consideration for a condor release? Our recovery plan for California condors requires us to re-establish the birds in as much as their former range as possible. Baja being the southernmost recent range for the California condor, works well in that they were only recently lost from the area, mid-1930s, 
and considerable habitat still remains. It is very isolated with very few people in the area. The mountains are spectacular, ranging up to 10,000 feet, or 3,000 meters. Our selected release site is at nearly 8,000 feet, 2,400 meters. Mike, how many birds do you envision flying free in this area, Baja, in the future? We will be releasing four to eight birds on a yearly basis and will reconsider the situation when we have 20 birds in the area. What age do the birds have to be before moving them? That's a good question. Typically, we move them at eight months to 18 months old. Birds are ready to fledge, or leave, from the nest at six to seven months of age. In our current release group in Baja, we have birds as old as 30 months. It will be interesting to see how they behave. I expect that they will want to range more than younger birds and make it challenging for us to keep up. Is there a maximum number of birds a certain area can support? Yes, it's called the carrying capacity for any area, for any species. In our case, our strategy to find that number is to saturate the environment to a level where we determine that the birds are showing difficulty either in finding food, behaviorally, or in survivorship. That level is greatly determined by the availability of food in the area and nesting possibilities. As the talk continues, answer questions 26 to 30. What do you hope to accomplish with this release in the long run? I expect that well within 10 years the condors will be flying north and joining birds already released in Southern California. Hopefully we will reach at least 150 birds in each of these populations within about 15 years. What would you say is the biggest contribution to the California condor program's success? That would have to be the fact that we were able to breed the birds in captivity from the 27 birds we started with in 1987 to the 205 birds we have today. This is thanks to cooperation between the San Diego Wild Animal Park the Los Angeles Zoo, and the World Center for Birds of Prey in Bois, Idaho. Are there any problems keeping track of and protecting your released animals outside of the U.S.? Nope. We are using radio transmitters and will be using the new satellite and GPS transmitters as well. Which system is better? Using satellites. The advantages over radio telemetry are numerous. It makes it possible to keep up with the bird's flight without being led miles in a matter of minutes. It took the young condor only a week to migrate across the state, and with just radio telemetry, poor weather can keep a plane grounded, and not all roads are accessible to track them on ground. New technology will allow one to be able to track birds that are not accessible by plane. Also, it is a new way to gauge the effectiveness of reintroduction. How so? If a condor transmitter works properly, researchers will get a location every 10 days for about two years. Do you see an end in sight for the need to breed condors in captivity? Yes, that would be great. But it will take a while for us to establish the two wild populations and make sure that they are sustainable. Part of our recovery is to maintain a captive flock of 150 birds in various zoos around the country as a safety net for the future. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Okay, can you quieten down, please? Now, today, I'm going to talk to you about your assignment. We've been studying the effects of the exchange rate, so I'm going to give you a project to do on this. Right, can you make some notes while I'm talking? The first thing that I'd like you to do in order to prepare this is to select where you're interested in.
I mean, which country? And therefore, which currency you're going to be operating in? OK, now, the purpose of the project is to make money. And I'm hoping some of you will make a significant amount. So, I want you to suppose that you have £100 that you will have to invest purely in the rises and falls of the exchange system. In other words, you'll be trying to predict rates. This is a project that you'll be doing together, but before you work together, you'll have to go off and research what you need to know about the economy of that country and how well it's doing or is expected to do in the near future. You could all make up a little information sheet with your notes on, clearly legible, because then I want you to get together, we can do that next week, and to go round and read about each other's countries. When you see how well or badly each country is doing, I want you to decide what your exchange rate is going to be against all the other currencies. After that is all sorted, what you're going to do is go around the other students and attempt to sell your money to the others. Remember, this will depend on the success of your country's economy and the rate you fixed for your currency. Now, you're not allowed to just swap currencies with each other, but you may wish to buy from the other countries. But you must do a proper transaction. All the way through this, you must keep your accounts properly for each transaction. I'll give you one week to do this, and then we will set a time for the deals to finish, a bit like the stock exchange. And, at that point, I will ask you to calculate how much you have made. Is that clear? You now have 30 seconds to read questions 37 to 40. OK, now before you begin that, there are a few things I want you to read up on to prepare. You need to look at the economies of the UK's main trading partners. I don't mean all of them, because that would be over 80, but just the 29 principal ones. There are summaries in the last three books on the book list I've given you. And so that you can practice applying the criteria on assessment I gave you, I'd then like you to focus just on one sector across all the countries. The most common one across every country is farming. But as much agricultural produce is for domestic consumption, I'd like you to look at manufacturing. Then I would like you to do a detailed investigation of one particular aspect. I was going to give you a choice, but I think as we've just started the course, it's better if we all look at the same thing and then we can discuss it in the seminars. So the thing I'd like you all to look at is fluctuations in import prices. Now, you need to do all that before you start the project as it will help you assess the economies of the countries you'll be representing in the project. Don't worry, you've got plenty of time. Exam week is December the 8th, then it's the holidays until January the 6th, so I don't need the project in till February the 5th. Is that OK? Now, any questions on this? Because it's You now have half a minute to check your answers.